So welcome again. This is the fourth session of this community conversation about food series. And we are just so excited to have you all here this afternoon and are really looking forward to the discussions that we'll be having. We have um, had some great sessions already uh, with some wonderful panelists that raise powerful concepts, issues that we can all work to address and insightful solutions and ways forward. While we are hoping to be able to convene back in person in March. Uh, we hope that we have come up with a valuable way of engaging conversations in our food system in the time of COVID-19. We recognize that not everyone has internet access and so not everyone may be able to participate in these sessions. I would like to therefore acknowledge that this is not a solution and by no means a final step. We hope that this is only the beginning of these kinds of conversations and um, what we hope is uh, an ongoing dialogue and actual action. So I am Megan Adams, a member of the Charlottetown Food Council, as well as a health promoter in the province's Department of Health and Wellness Chief Public Health Office, and I have the wonderful pleasure of moderating today's session. We also have the background tech support uh, from John Kimmel, as you just met, Jackie Skamen, project manager, and food council members who will be supporting some of the breakout discussions. So here's an overview of what you can expect for today's session. We will start with an interview with our guest panelists and then break out into smaller group discussions and finally come back for a question and answer period. Please again, use the chat box throughout to ask your questions. Uh, we hope to get everything covered within the hour that we have allotted and I will do my very best to keep things moving along and respect your time. I would also like to acknowledge that this is a safe and inclusive space for open dialogue about our local food system and for knowledge sharing. Please be respectful of other participants and please feel free to engage in the conversation in whatever way you mo feel most comfortable. Again, use the chat box throughout um, if you have any questions. Before we begin today's session, I would like to acknowledge that the land that we are calling in from and discussing as it relates to food is in Abiquid Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and un unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. When talking about food, we must ensure that we acknowledge the land which we produce on and its history and that we honor our peace and friendship treaties. So the goal of these conversations is really just to bring community together with their neighbors, community champions, leaders and experts to start having conversations about food and our local food system to validate our food asset map, um, which we will present later, and to guide the future work of the Charlottetown Food Council. Speaking of which, who is the Food Council? I do see some, some participants who have been on a number of calls, but if you're new here today, the Food Council was established in July 2018 by the City of Charlottetown, and it's a group that works um, in, a collaborative, in a collaborative manner to tackle issues within the food system through advocacy, initiatives, and policies. The vision of the Food Council is for a, a vibrant community built on a healthy food system. The council brings together um, individuals from different backgrounds, perspectives, and expertise, and the current members are Karen Murchison, Morgan Palmer, Phil Ferraro, Brad Dwaron, Sheena Matthew, Colleen Walton, and Chairperson Bernie Floyd. Our city support is the wonderful Katrina Crystal, Sustainability Officer for Charlottetown. This is a wonderful group of people that I have the honor of working with, and they all wear so many hats in our community while being so passionate about improving our local food system. One of the first actions of the Food Council was to develop a food charter. And this is a vis vision statement that describes uh, what our local food system should look like. This was an important first step to ensure that action in advocacy policy and projects remain embedded in the council's value and goals. So there are a number of foundational principles to the guiding document. Um, and I'm just in the interest of time gonna skip through here. That document along with some other guiding documents for the Food Council's work can all be found on the city's website and the Food Council's page. So why are we talking about food asset mapping and why, why might it be valuable? Food assets are the actual places where people can grow, prepare, share, buy, receive, or learn about food. They are the resources and strengths that already exist in a community and community mapping is just one way to create a snapshot of our food system. The reason we would want a map like this is to identify the, the existing strengths that we have to then engage residents, organizations, and decision makers in conversations about our local food system. A local food asset map will also help the Food Council and other related organizations gain a better understanding of where opportunities may be to improve our local food system sustainability and inclusivity through partnerships, themes, uh, partnerships, policies, um, and projects relating to um, some of the guiding themes. So the hope of this series is to touch on a number of different themes of our food charter and food asset map. Our theme today is buying and celebrating, and this is meant to highlight and celebrate assets in our own food system to encourage more citizens to buy and support local, as well as to foster and supportive environments to make buying and supporting local easier. 
there is value, as we know, in purchasing local goods, and that can have direct and indirect impacts on our local economy. The action of buying and supporting local is an asset in itself, but it sometimes is only focused on for certain days of the year. So how can we encourage citizens to buy and support local every day of the year and foster environments that primarily support local? How can the asset map be a tool to buy and celebrate local? These are the conversations we're hoping to have today. This is an important theme and of course by no means a solution to improving our local food system so the hope is that this is the first of many conversations that translate into real inclusive and sustainable action. So we are delighted to have some incredible panelists with us this afternoon. Um, we've had so many great discussions with others and I'm really excited about the panel we have here again today. We have um, Ken Thompson. So he is the Director of Finance and Food Tourism at food, food Island Partnership, where he works to grow the PEI food industry, including integrating food and tourism. Kent has worked with entrepreneurs or been an entrepreneur for most of his life, including growing up on a dairy farm, operating the Blue Muscle Cafe on PEI's North Shore, working as product development officer with the PEI Department of Agriculture, and leading the launch of L Lucky Fox Snack Company, a gourmet snack company based in PEI. He currently oversees the Fall Flavors Festival, um, which is, as you may know, a month-long province-wide celebration of PEI food. The festival um, showcases and harvests the harvest from land and sea here in PEI and features celebrity chefs as well. In 2020, the organization launched the Canada's Food Island Gift Card Program that allows consumers to purchase one gift card that can be used uh, at food and other tourism-related businesses across the province as well. So we are really excited to have you here with us today, Kent. Welcome. Stephanie McQuaid uh, is an Islander and a lover of all things local. She promotes local through her social media channels as the Redhead Roamer. This includes going to local restaurants, visiting island farms, and chatting with local food champions. When COVID is not ruining her fun, she can be found attending events like Farm Day in the City, Fall Flavors, and Forage Food Symposium. When she's not out experiencing the best island fair, Stephanie can be found working as a registered nurse in Charlottetown. I think uh, we're in good hands with her, her great uh, influencer perspective here today. Welcome, Stephanie. It's so wonderful to have you with us. Pierre El Hajar has, was born into a farming family in Lebanon, and Pierre began his career at the age of eight making bread alongside his mother. Upon graduating from culinary school, Pierre worked at the, the wide variety of hotels and restaurants. Um, and since he has accumulated over 20 years of culinary experience, he has occupied the position of head head chef at Carrefour, Ile Saint-Jean, Ecole france since May 2013. Pierre is a certified Red Seal chef and he is awarded uh, the Pear Award for Outstanding Nutrition Education and Health Initiatives and was named the 2017 Diversity Champion here in PEI. I also know that Pierre serv previously served as a member of the Charlottetown Food Council and I have personally seen the amazing programs that he runs through the, the Centre Carrefour and we are in good hands today. Thank you for joining us to Pierre today, Pierre. So I'm so excited to have the opportunity to speak and listen to you this afternoon. I think you all bring different food backgrounds and perspectives and are going to complement each other so well. Uh, so we'll get things started off with a fairly broad question related to this theme. Um, and that would be, how can our local food system be celebrated more to encourage citizens to buy and support local every single day? And maybe we'll start with Kent and then we'll move down the line there. Sure. So I, I think, Megan, when we talked about this yesterday, to me, it's this is what we work on all the time. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time because I'm more interested in other responses. But the big thing, the big places we see it is through collaborations. Um, you know, even one of the early projects I worked on was BEI Burger Love. Um, and, and the big way that that works is having all the restaurants work together on a common promotion. Um, so sharing those activities and then and making it easy for people to support local. I think sometimes we, we sell the idea of it, but it's a go to this store, buy this thing and you can support local, you know. So, so I think those are the big areas that, that we work on. So I'm going to pass it over to the other panelists. That's great. Thanks. And, and uh, maybe we'll move on to Pierre um, for, to build on that question. So how can, how can our local food system be celebrated more to encourage citizens to buy and support local every day? Uh, I think uh, people are more willing to watch videos than, than typically read. In making uh, short videos of local farmers or short videos on how to use local ingredients 
link to recipes or making some sort of social posts on blog content. Of course, uh, building uh, asset map for sure. And, uh, and something really important here is engage the audience and how to buy local and how, what is the benefit behind that? And the education for, for of course, the education is the audience also. You have to, they have to understand that the zucchini you buy from PI is not the same you buy from Mexico. This is really important. <clears throat> That's great, Pierre. Thanks so much. And I think you make a great point about the asset map. And that's one of the reasons why we're here today. There's that level of education and, and sharing it in that way. And hope that's the hope of what an asset map can do. Um, but what, what are the next steps from there? Um, Stephanie, would you like to build on, on the, that first question there? How can we encourage citizens to buy and support every single day? Yeah, I totally agree with what you guys said. I think in my lens and what I do in this field, um, I think making that connection between the producer, the grower and the consumer, I think people want to buy from people, not just buy a product. So if we can get the faces of people out there and their stories, I think that comes to people's mind when they're in the store and they're choosing between, like you said, a zucchini from Mexico or a zucchini from here. Um, and again, what you said with the education peer, I think that helps a lot. Uh, this year, I actually had an opportunity. I headed out to Crosdale Farms and I got to see the whole, you know, dairy production process uh, with their automated systems. And I put that out through my social. And I think it really helped people to see and understand all the work and the science that goes behind this, as well as to educate them on, you know, like the blue sticker with the cow so that they see that and they know, okay, this is local milk. I think, uh, like you said, education and just awareness is a big part of it. That's great, Stephanie. I, th I think that's such a good point. And I really like how you emphasize the emphasize the faces there. Um, and that sort of is a good segue too. I think to the next question. Um, hopefully we can build on some of these points more. Um, but what are some ways that community groups and leaders can foster, foster supportive environments to ensure local products and entrepreneurs are supported? Um, and so maybe uh, we'll go in the same similar order. Kent, do you want to maybe start us off there? Sure. I, I think one thing, you know, it is, you know, you think of all the groups and meetings that we have, I mean, pre-COVID times and hopefully post-COVID times, but just, you know, getting and making sure that products are, are local when you do it and then telling the story behind the food. You know, people like, I think Pierre nailed it with uh, just because it's, it's a product that's grown in PEI. If it's out of season, it's probably not from here. But, you know, you know, even with with Crasdale Farms of saying, you know, this is ADL milk, it's owned by 165 dairy farmers from across the province, that, you know, these are things that they do, and, and really making sure that you, you present it with it, it's more than just, this is chocolate milk, this is PEI chocolate milk made with care by our dairy farmers, you know, in particular, here's some of the farmers, and, and making sure that people understand it is that whole story behind the food and how it's produced and how it got there. Yeah, I think you make a very good point about seasons too. The PI Food Exchange has done a lot of education there. I know with some of the the um, calendars that they've created, but getting that information out there more, you know, strawberries, eating them in, in November, um, they're not local, um, but how can we ensure that we're supporting that more in when it is in season? Uh, completely agree. Pierre, would you like to build on that a little bit more? How can, how can groups and leaders foster those supportive environments to ensure that, that those local products and entrepreneurs are supported? I think we have to start to do uh, a local business uh, network where people can engage with local businesses remotely where businesses can promote deals and services during this time, you know, COVID. For example, if you are a web designer or developer or a social, social media experts, you can offer your service to local businesses that do not have the online presence and help them promote online, especially during this COVID. And uh, like as a chef, you can, you can do a recipe depend on what is season, you know? So you do recipes, is, Today we have uh, cauliflower, beetroot, you can do recipe and what we have in season. Pierre, I, I, having attended some of your um, 
uh, sessions and, and the Centre Carry for there. I know that you really work to ensure that things are cooked with what's in season. And, and I think that's just really wonderful um, for people to be aware of the different recipes that you can come up with, with there. And I just really like what you mentioned there about working as a, um, almost as a unit collaboratively, because every aspect of the food supply chain, um, if we work together, we can all bring our expertise and pulling in some of the more non-traditional food uh, sectors too, like like web design, as you mentioned. So that's that's a really wonderful point. Um, Stephanie, would you like to add any any thoughts there for this question? Um, I know you, you you're at the individual level there, but that's okay. <laughs> what was that? Sorry, Stephanie. I think I'm good on this one. Okay, sounds good. We'll move on to the next one. And I just, I think that um, something that's always important to recognize too is that supportive environments is about making that choice easier for citizens. Um, and so it's always something to consider when we implement policies and projects. And for anyone listening today, um, you know, ensuring that the institutions you're a part of or the organizations you're a part of, or um, you know, when thinking about the food council, how can we hold those folks accountable to make sure that that, that um, is embedded in, in what they're doing. Um, so we'll move on to from we'll move on from organizations now to individuals and residents now. And so um, I would ask you all, how can individuals connect connect with local online, and what might be the role of business or businesses and influencers in helping people to connect online? Um, we'll, we can go in the same order, Kent. If you want to start us off there, I get the hot seat first every time, eh? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to mix it up, we can feel free no, to. No, no. <laughs> I mean. It, no, I think that one of the one of the big things that kind of builds on that what's in season, and so it was something that that we worked on when I used to work with the Department of Agriculture, and and having that fresh products directory and the what's in season guide. So it's at the Canada's Food Island .ca website, and and showing you know if it's where what's in season each month, and then you can click on it, and then it gives you producers that produce that product. So I think it's it's understanding that side of it, um, and and then it's so and and it's for us to keep it up to date and for it you know and and I think it's probably beyond just buying raw goods. It's also with restaurants too. Um, you know, a lot of our restaurants support local, so we've got the Culinary Trail that also recognizes that group of of people that you know not everyone's going to buy raw products and and cook them at home, but you know going into the restaurants and finding a restaurant and connecting with them and then sharing the experience. I think it's important, you know, I'm sure Stephanie can talk more about, you know, influencers, but just even knowing, you know, your neighbors are doing that and that you're part of, of a community online of, of people and, and a community locally of, of people. Yeah, I think you make some great points there, Kent, and I, I really like the one um, about rest, restaurants supporting local and something that our food council is even talking about is, is what is the definition of local procurement? We do have a lot of places that really um, strive to have all products supporting local. And so how can we highlight those as assets and how can we encourage and incentivize others to do the same? Um, and then it's about that education for folks too, as you said, for the, for the seasonal aspects. Um, so maybe we'll move on to, to Pierre there for that question about engaging people online and in a way that supports local. So I want to talk about influencers today. I think uh, social media influencers uh, can connect their followers uh, with our story and product, and uh, and they already know. I think uh, will be relevant and useful to them because they know uh, their audience and what they want actually. Influencers can have the ability, I think, to connect with, connect us to the right people. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think we're probably in very good hands for this question with Stephanie here too. So, so do you want to want to weigh in on that question, Stephanie? How, how can we encourage people to connect online um, in a way that, you know, supports local? I know it's something you do so well every day, but maybe some tools for, for residents and businesses to do as well. Yeah, and I think uh, what you guys said is exactly right. I think it's a great tool to to get businesses and products and produce in front of people. 
I think it's, I kind of see myself as like the bridge, you know, helping you get connected to people, whatever your product is, your produce are. And I think that's kind of the first step is getting you in front of the audience, which I, you know, myself or anyone else who does this um, can assist with. But I think there's a lot that the business owner or producer can do to really help people feel connected with them because I know I'm more likely to buy from someone that I feel like I know. And I feel like the world of social media gives us that sense of, you know, I follow people that I don't know, but I feel like they're my friends. And when you, the more you get to know these people, the more you want to support them. So I think, you know, there's a lot of work that people can do, even just showing you know, their connection between their suppliers and their retailers and their producers and the whole process of whatever it is they do. Again, let's say we use the dairy farm for an example, something to them that might seem very normal, everyday, mundane is something that me as a, you know, everyday, not a farmer doesn't have a clue about is really fascinating. And I think that creates buy-in and those connections that people need. So I think, you know, having a good social media presence. Um, you don't have a lot of, have a lot of followers, but just, you know, posting consistently what you're doing, people will connect with that and they'll think of you when it is time to, you know, connect and support and purchase locally. I, I think that's, that's just such a great way of saying that. And I really like how you're talking about faces and, and, Islanders, we want to know where we're getting our stuff from and, and the stories behind that. And as you said, if you're thinking, if you know the face, then you're thinking about who that might be. And I think that's a really great way. Um, and why we're here talking today about our local food assets to celebrate them. Um, and how can we, you know, support them further. And I, I think that's a really, really great point. Um, so something that was highlighted this year was how important supporting local can be in times of crisis. Um, we talked about access to food for our community members, as well as getting access to food out there for producers and distributors in our first session. And then the other night, we talked also about how powerful neighborhood level support can be. Um, so COVID-19 has really highlighted um, how isolated our food system might be um, and, and that there is an opportunity to build local food sovereignty here. So I'd just like to get your thoughts there. Um, and so how can we provide opportunities for individuals to support local, particularly um, in COVID-19 and in times of crisis when in-store participation is limited? Um, maybe it, we'll go with the same order. I'm, I'm following you on the screen. I'm not putting you on the spot, Kent. <laughs> no, I, I think that, I mean, there's a couple of ways. And, and one of them that I've seen that a lot of places, I'm looking at Bernie, like with the Charlottetown Farmers Market and others, it is a, creating ways that are easy. The curbside pickups, the online orders that, that really, I was impressed with how many businesses, I hate to use the word pivot, but they pivoted quickly online and, and they started to offer that. So, you know, a lot of them, you know, I think of Sobeys as a large, large chain wasn't able to do it, but the Charlottetown farmer's market was, and, and they really responded to the community. Um, and then one thing that we've kind of tried to help them with is through the Canvas Food Island gift card program. So, you know, you can buy that gift card and then use it at a hundred different places. So again, you know, and it's, and it's a cashless system. So a lot of people not wanting to have, you know, no contact pay um, and it works for online payment too. So, so I think that those is just making sure, you know, on, and it's our responsibility with the, with the operators that they're able to provide something that the community wants and that we don't let Amazon or, you know, some of the larger chains to be able to change and, and we can't respond to. So, so I think just making sure that we make it easy for, for people to do it. That's exactly, um, it's, it's so important to make that easy for the eater. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about education here already and how, you know, it is easy to support local if the environment is fostering that. And so decision makers and organizations, how can we do that? Um, I think that's such a great point, Kent. Yeah. And so Pierre, would you like to build on that? Like how can we provide more opportunities for folks to, to support local, even if they're in times of crisis, um, like we experienced this year? I have the same idea of Kent actually, as Kent. Uh, I think we can create online directory with all local product and information and links. 
uh, we can offer and we can support creating online marketplaces for all local businesses. I think this will uh, this should grow the capacity for curbside pickups. That's great. Thanks, Pierre. Um, Stephanie, what about you? Do you have any thoughts there about engagement online? You may have seen um, some of that groundswelling during during the the COVID stages or or storms. Even that's something that we talked about the other the other night too. Yeah. No, I definitely. You know, when we were in, I always call it lockdown, but I don't know if that's whatever people call it. Um, I definitely was trying to support local, but I found that a lot of the local businesses here on PEI had done a really good job with their marketing and they were, you know, putting all over Facebook and Instagram that they had, you know, local delivery curbside pickup. And I think knowing that I bought stuff that I, what was like one day we bought 10 pounds of muscles and they got delivered to our door. I wasn't sitting at home thinking I want muscles, but they put the idea out there in front of me. And I said, of course, I want to support them. I imagine they're having a hard time. So I think everyone did a really good job. That being said, I don't know on the back side of that, how difficult and challenging it is you know, for a business to be driving all over the island. But as a consumer, I found when I saw an opportunity that, you know, they were coming right to my house. Why wouldn't I support local? Absolutely. And I think that to that point, something that we talked about in the very first session um, with Soleil and Trisha was um, working as a unit. And I know we've already talked about working as a unit, but often we've got so many um, uh, smaller producers that are trying to get their product out there. And so working as a unit together on that end, um, and it might be in the marketing of it, it might be in the promotions of it, it might be in the delivery of it. Um, so working as a unit there to make it easier for the eater, eater to just say, yeah, of course, I'm going to, I'm going to buy local. Um, absolutely. So thanks for that. Um, I think we'll move on then. So th there's certainly actions at policy project and, and sort of that decision-making level that do have powerful impact, but individual level action does not go unnoticed. And, and there are certainly big waves that could be made here. So I, I would like to ask you all, how can people use their own power to support local? And that might be, you know, is it is it re reducing food waste and getting that into the hands of, of others? I know, Pierre, you might be able to build on that a little bit more, or is it just liking and sharing a post or is it actually showing up and, and purchasing? So how can people use their own power to support local? How can we ensure that even when supporting local businesses, we're supporting local food? And how can the purchasing power be used to achieve this? Um, so we'll start with Kent again there. Sure. I, I mean, within this group, I don't, I think we've, we've got the converted. So I mean, it's, but really, it, it's, it's a strong belief. And I have it that, that we vote every day with our dollar, you know, that that's really where you choose. And, and that speaks volumes at the cash register. So when you, you make that choice, you know, and, and when you go to somewhere and, you know, if you're going out to eat tonight and there's asparagus on the table, ask them where it came from because it, it sure didn't come from PEI, you know, and, and push them and say, well, why wouldn't you have something more local? It's, you know, it's, it's turnip season. It's, we've got PEI potatoes. There's lots of root vegetables that we could be having on that. And, and it, it makes it slightly uncomfortable. So not everybody wants to ask, but you know, if, if you're at the grocery store and they have a beautiful selection of, of meats, but they all came from Argentina, you know, that doesn't really help us all. So, so, you know, making sure you ask. And then I think like Stephanie does is, is share. So show that your support and show these are the decisions I made and, and do it from pride, you know, talking about, this is this is what we do. I like to support my neighbor. I know these types of things. So, so it's really just you know asking, knowing that your dollar makes a huge difference. Absolutely, and and asking the question starts the conversation, like we're doing here today. Um, we're starting that conversation, but getting it to the to the level of as you said, this is a group we're all sort of on the same page here, but having those conversations that may be uncomfortable, um, but we're holding people accountable. We're holding people accountable to be supporting local in every aspect of what they're doing. I, I really, really like that. Um, something that I'm trying to do more is asking where things are from and, and only ordering something that would be 
local on the menu if I'm out to eat, for example. Um, Pierre, would you like to build on that for, um, you know, that individual level purchasing power or using their own power to support local? Uh, I want to talk today about uh, the big stores. So we have to encourage all the stores that to use signs to identify which food are locally grown and indicate the source of the product. So which farm, MPI, if it's local or where it's coming from. And uh, if uh, we can use the asset map to indicate uh, local businesses, who's able to provide bulk and who's able to, to provide wholesale also, this will help us. Absolutely. And something that we've talked about at the, the Food Council as well is is what that looks like in, in sort of the bigger chain stores and, and how do we promote local in those bigger institutions as well. Um, and and even our local institutions, what, what are the local procurement policies there too, uh, for sure. Stephanie, would you like to weigh in on that for, for the individual power that people have um, and that, you know, it might be, it might seem like a small action, but it can go a long way. Yeah, no, I definitely think that, you know, educating yourself has a lot to do with it. And I think using like tools like Kent had said on the Food Island Partnership website to understand what is in season and where you can get that is a really good place to start. But again, just echoing what the other said, just asking when you're out at restaurants and, you know, it is a little bit uncomfortable, but, you know, that'll probably end up going further up from your waiter or waitress. And maybe, you know, if enough people ask, then they'll make that change I think too just anytime you're out supporting I always share whatever I'm doing so for me it just comes second nature if I'm supporting local or I'm out of visiting a farm just showing people um, what we have here and I know that um, in past years when I have attended like the fall flavors events it really opened my eyes to the quality of food produce and seafood that we have here um, because there are these internationally famous chefs that are here and they are so excited to cook with our produce, our seafood, our beef. They can't wait. And that really stuck with me that if these high up internationally known chefs who are experts in this field are excited to use our produce, I should be excited that I can use them every day. Yeah, I, I really think that that's a, something that's come up in all four conversations is that we're so fortunate here. We have such a vibrant community. We've got vibrant food food system um, and we've got really quality food. And so ha like take advantage of that and, and celebrate that. Absolutely. I do want to acknowledge, I just saw in um, someone in the chat, thanks for reaching out. Um, we have brought up some examples about seasonal and, and how we can support seasonal, but we're also talking about stuff that's made year round. It's just a, an easy, tangible example, I guess, probably to, to talk about seasonal things and, and why we might support them in, in one season, because that's when we produce and harvest it here. Um, but of course, we're talking about food that we produce here all year round to um, the idea just being about supporting local every single day, which I would like to, I know we're sort of over time here for, for our interview session, but I would ask one more question and, and maybe you can contribute your final thoughts in addition to um, this question. And we're really talking about, we've got some wonderful events that we, we promote and, and have here in PEI and in Charlottetown, but how can we take it from like perhaps a one day or a one month long event and then embed it 365 days of the year? Um, and so how can we go every single day beyond the event? How can we engage wider communities in these conversations and in helping them support local too? And I'll welcome any final thoughts as well. So we'll start with you, Kent. Yeah, and, and I'm just seeing some of the, the chat there from both David and Phil, and I think they're raising some good points is, you know, a lot of the focus we do is on is on tourists and, and kind of, you know, the higher end er income earners. And I think it's an area that's been hit particularly hard by COVID is, you know, we have some really great community gardens, um, some facilities, you know, with a legacy garden or debris or, or throughout, but then the shared kitchen to be able to process that product. And I think that's an, an area that really helps people support every day because for being able to take, you know, to get a 50 pound bag of potatoes, the price isn't isn't out of this world, but not everybody would have a place in a kitchen that they could do that. So, so, I mean, hopefully we're, we're moving out of this world in the next year, 
and we can get back to being able to use community kitchens and, and have places where people can process this food and make it more accessible to the general public. Because I think that in, in you know, the average consumer in PEI, we do shoot above our weight in, in supporting local. It's one when I go to other places that a lot of places, a lot of people are really envious of the support, but it is how do we create the access for everybody and, and have places where they can process food and learn about how to process food and, and being able to use it affordably because you know, the product is there and whether you even going out you know, and, and what was done with, with going through some of the farmer's fields after the harvest and, and picking up that crop, but then it needs to be processed and so it can store and so we can use it throughout the year. So, so I think that's probably the, the big thing of, of how do we help more of the general public in would, would be in through the community gardens and access through those spaces. Mm, I'm so glad that you brought that up, Kent. Thank you. I think that things like gleaning and collaborating together, sharing gardening skills and and that neighborhood support that we talked about the other night too, like I might prepare extra carrots and you might produce extra lettuce and then we'll, we'll share that. Um, and the hope for a food asset map would be to highlight some of those community spaces to prepare those cold storage spaces anything like that that makes it more accessible and relevant to our residents for sure pierre would you like to, to weigh in on that how can we um, move some of these events to 365 days of the year and and i'll i'll open it up for any th final thoughts for you as well so uh, for the events i think we have to make sure that these events are available available in all communities across pi and uh we uh we need to offer the ability to open the farmer's market, for example, every day. I think this will allow for the lenders to purchase local product as their need, needs arise, uh, implement a promotional system maybe, and reward system for purchasing local products. This will help uh, people to buy more local product, I think. I, I like that. And I think we're already starting to talk about that at the Food Council in Charlottetown. Um, and I know we're talking about Charlottetown here today. There's obviously, you know, we can talk about different levels of community. I think that's something important to recognize, too, that PEI is a community, provincial community. We've got different municipalities. That's what we're focused on as the Charlottetown Food Council. Then there's the smaller communities and neighborhood levels, too. Um, but absolutely sort of recognizing that working as a unit in that way and, um yeah, I, I, I'm so glad you brought that up here. Uh, Stephanie, would you like to build on that 365 days, sort of embedding that every single day and open it up to any final thoughts for you? I think in like my realm, my goal for that would be to just continuously posting and con with consistent messaging of supporting local and why it's important and trying to highlight farmers and just I see my role as kind of the education piece and linking those. Yeah, that, that's great. I, I think that this has been such a powerful conversation and I hope it's the first of many. And I think that, uh, um, I think that really we just need to collaborate together, pull in some of those non-traditional sectors that, that can really support our food systems to be thriving, our producers, our chefs, all of that. So I just am so lucky to have you as a panel here today. I think you've all brought such diverse background. We will, unfortunately, we are, we're sort of over time, out of time, but we will be coming back for a little bit of a deeper dive. Um, and so for now, um, keep writing your questions in the chat box and all of that, but we are going to move to the next portion of, of today. So um, you will be going into breakout sessions and you will have moderators there to engage in conversations um, about th this theme and the food asset map. map. Um, right now, John is going to pull up for me. Um, we have created a short video to describe the food asset map and its interactive tool. It's just a snapshot. And once the video is over, you will be going right into the breakout sessions. Don't be shy to participate in, in your community conversations. And thanks to our panelists. Welcome back, everyone. I know that was a, a whole lot of time um, to have conversations. And I just want to acknowledge again that this is the start of, uh, of, 
of having these conversations and and engaging in, with our neighbors and and decision makers and organizations in some of these. So hopefully, um, we can we can keep this momentum going. So I will. Um, I would like to now. I know. Um, we're sort of close to the end of what would an hour be, but we will uh, keep folks on for a few more minutes for a question and answer period. I know that there were some in the chat box there um, and I've, I've got so many questions and, and we've got a great panel for us here. So um, I will open that. If you do have to slip out right at three, um, thanks for participating and there will be a follow-up email going out um, with with information um, as well. And I would ask you now too, in the remaining time that we do have to please answer the Mentimeter questions that we do have um, available for you. I think John has posted it in the chat box. Um, yeah, I see that he has. Um, so go there and ans uh, answer some of those questions. We'll be using one of the questions as a closing activity. Um, so again, welcome back to our panelists. Thanks mm -hmm. for, for everyone to everyone, everyone participating in the um, discussion rooms. Um, I know that there was some great uh, ideas that came up in, in my room. So hopefully it was the same for everyone there. I'm just going to scroll back to the top here and, and go through some of the questions. Um, keep posting them in the chat box and I'll try to keep this to probably just 10 minutes. Um, so we can government facilitate um, is one question. Can government from David, um, governments facilitate more greenhouse construction to lengthen the availability of foods, and that's a that's a great question. Um, and perhaps some of the panelists want to weigh in there. Um, I know that in our room we talked about uh, freezers and community hubs as another way of of lengthening the availability of foods as well. So, um, does anyone want to to contribute to that? Yeah, it, it is actually something the Department of Agriculture has um there's a funding program i think it's called the agri-food market development program um it was the old by pei program i know because i helped create it and it was something we saw back in 2007 2008 is at the farmer's market there wasn't a lot of local vegetables outside of kind of the you know the asparagus coming up in june to you know the fall harvest so it, I think it covers the, um, it, it's both row crops and cold houses. So not the unheated greenhouses, um, as well as using plastic culture to, to have crops come up early. So I think again, it's making sure people know and especially new market gardeners know that that, that funding is there. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it's about 50% funded up to $5,000. That's great. Thanks, Kent. And I think that's um, a role that the Food Council can play too and, and other related groups that getting that information out there and making it easier for folks that are working in the industry um, to know what's available for them. Um, Pierre, I don't know if you want to touch on um, the, not the greenhouse aspect, but the hydroponic system that I know you've got there, like that's another way um, and maybe funds, you know, in a similar sense and, and the um, great way that that's worked for your community center. Oh, you're on mute, Pierre. Sorry. Bottom left there. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, maybe I'll move on. So I know that um, Mary Laura had mentioned, um, uh, I'm just rereading this here, um, unique solutions for green spaces, hospital, um, you know, around pl places like hospitals, building raised beds so that that patients, for example, can participate in that. I think that's a really wonderful point. And I think that's a way um, to connect social connection, mental wellness, and food skills and food sovereignty and, and our food system all together. Um, does anyone want to weigh in there on, on ways that we can, um, you know, we've got a lot of community gardens here, but how can we do more and better? And where are some of the gaps? I love the idea of having a garden at the hospital. I know, you know, as a nurse logistically with infection control and stuff, I don't know if it would actually be able to happen with patients, but even if they could have a garden there that they use to sell food in the cafeteria that are given to patients in their room, I think that would be super awesome. There's definitely lots of green space out there that they could use. Yeah. 
And it's one of those things too about the local procurement, like what are our, what what level of local are our big institutions supporting, mm-hmm. and how can we hold folks accountable and and you know institutions like universities and and hospitals and those kind of things, and are they buying local? You know, a community garden like that that would be really wonderful, help with patient care, but also embed that that local sense too. Kent, did you want to build on that one at all? Yeah, and I because I, I know hospitals are are challenging, you know, when you get control. But I, I do agree, especially within the therapeutic side of things, is it's such a healing. I'm a gardener, so I, you know, I, I understand that completely. Um, the other one that that was started, and I'm not sure where it went, was Chartwell's at UPEI. We're working with um, with students to have community garden beds that they produce and then Chartwells would buy from them. There was, you know, they even have a guideline developed. I think that was back 2015 or 2016. Um, but it is that continued, you know, pushing and promoting and that it, it was beyond just when they were trying to get the bid to have all of the uh, food service that, you know, holding them accountable and make sure they're buying from the students and, and the students are, are producing food because it was surprising how many students are, are food insecure and, and that gave them a way to you know, pay for and as well as contribute to, to the cafeteria experience. Mm, I'm really glad that you touched on that. Um, I think that that is something that we really need to embed more in all these conversations. And while we didn't have a theme specific to food security, um, during this series, it definitely comes up in all the sessions. Um, there are groups that do not have the same access to food. And so how can we make sure that everyone does have that, that they're contributing um, to the food system? I mean, if, if you eat food in Charlottetown, you are a part of the food system. And, and how can we make sure everyone feels that they are a part of that? And I think that's a really important way. Um, and I know that, you know, the, the idea behind a school food program, that's something that you know, we're starting to have those conversations more about how do we support local and embed it in in every day. Um, So that's a, that's a great point. And I think Um, certainly, Megan, jumping in with um, education, I think it's really important that we teach our students really early, like teach children that and build those skills. I mean, I'm a dietitian by profession and I remember um, the foods lab instructor at UPEI saying to me that she, it was not uncommon for her to have 18 year old, 19 year old students that had never cracked an egg. Mm-hmm. So how do you get through um, all of your years of schooling? Um, and maybe they weren't coming from Canada. Maybe they had not been in our education system, system but even still, how do we ensure that um, we create those opportunities for students to learn that you know, carrots grow in the ground and this is when they're harvested and, and this is where you can access local, um, local skills and also food. Yeah, thanks so much, Mary Laura. And I think you really highlight the different ways that food assets can be presented. It might be learning about food, it might be skills related to cooking, it might be skills related to growing. Um, and and how, how do we ensure everyone um, is able to access those food assets and, and and are able to contribute to the food system in that way. Um, And certainly educating early on, we know that exposure to different types of foods is really important early on too. We've got really vibrant different cultures um, in our community here in PEI and Charlottetown and how can that be embedded? So that's a really great point. Thanks, Mary Laura. And I think that ties into the whole education component that's been touched on in all of the themes. I'm looking here through the chat box and I'm just, I don't want to miss anyone's questions. David, David, did you want to come on camera to ask your question there? Or did I already cover it? (laughs) Sure. Uh, Well, I I wouldn't mind bringing in something that we talked about in the breakout session, which is uh, also I had put in the the chat. And that is that uh, uh, one thing, that could be very helpful is, well, season extension through the, the greenhouses I was talking about, but also uh, making the produce that is produced in season available lo- uh, throughout the year through uh, facilitating uh, freezing of vegetables, uh, somehow uh, making sure that there are the facilities uh, to, to freeze 
at both the level of the producers and of like local community gardeners, whether it's from their own ha uh, quarter acre uh, in, in a subdivision or uh, from the community gardens, such as the Legacy Garden. Um, I think that uh, commercial level freezers and areas for uh, the pre preparation of, uh, of uh, produce for freezing uh, could make it so that people could have local foods all through the year because we're, we're habituated to that, right? We're used to being able to get anything any time of year. And uh, I think it would be great for everyone to eat seasonally. I try to eat seasonally as much as I can. Uh, you know, I, I try to resist the asparagus this time of year, <laughs> but um, I think it's important to, uh, uh, to have local food available out of season as well. And, mm -hmm. and the, I think there are ways that we could facilitate that to make it possible. Yeah. David, actually, I can uh, respond to that. Uh, first off, uh, with regards to the previous conversation, um, I'm actually pursuing funding for the Legacy Garden to be a, a horticultural therapy uh, location uh, that will have a program there. I think that's a really valuable evolution of the garden is to provide that service. And uh, in terms of uh, freezers, actually I'm, I'm pursuing getting funding to uh, get uh, a commercial scale uh, freeze dryer. Um, two reasons. One is uh, uh, freeze dried food lasts uh, almost indefinitely. Uh, 20, 25 years is not unreasonable for freeze dried food. Whereas food in a freezer, uh, you don't really want to keep it for more than a year. And uh, not everybody can afford a freezer or freezer space. Uh, whereas uh, freeze dried food uh, takes up very little space and can be stored in a cabinet. Um, so those are things that we're trying to pursue there. And uh, if anybody wants to make a contribution, uh, actually this afternoon, I just uh, opened up an uh, online uh, contribution portal for the uh, Legacy Garden. <laughs> I did see that, Phil. Thanks. I'm glad you got your plug in there. That's great. And I think that it's important. I think what you've just highlighted, uh, Phil and David, there are the different layers of supportive environments. So there's the layer of like the physical um uh, having the, the physical spaces to do some of these things to ensure that we're um, increasing our access to, to local, but then there's the layer of making it easy for people to access that. And if there were neighborhood levels and all of those things, I am conscious of the time. So Kent and Stephanie, I, I would like to open the floor up to you for any final um, thoughts about our theme here today. You know, we're talking about um, creating some of those environments to make supporting local easier, um, celebrating and highlighting our local food assets, and then filling the gaps and, and taking some of those single one-off events to 365 days of the year. So I'll leave the floor to you for some final thoughts there um, before we close out. Yeah, I, I mean, this is an ongoing conversation, and I, and I think we've got some fantastic champions here, is, is I think that that's knowing it's an ongoing conversation is is important and i think how do we how do we make sure that the next generation understands the importance and that it continues because you know pei we call it food island but it it's been a place for food productions well beyond european times so you know i think that it's our our role is to how do we keep celebrating that and how do we keep moving forward so I'm really excited by the, the discussion today. Yeah, thanks for that, Kent. I think that that generations to come, we not, wanna make sure that our land um, is protected and, and here for, for many generations to come and, and all of the wonderful food assets that we have here are, are here for many generations too. I'm, I'm glad you touched on that. Stephanie, any final thoughts? Well, I think yeah, this conversation today with all of you has just kind of reignited my interest and love in this. And, you know, I know I'm definitely going to further educate myself and just to continue to spread the message as often as I can, uh, you know, to all the Islanders and even people that aren't from here just to support local within their own community. 
That's great. And and I know you're not directly uh, within the food system, but you are a local food ac- advocate and therefore a food ad- asset, Stephanie. So thanks for joining us. And Kent, you do you do amazing work to to continue to to celebrate and and keep us proud of our our local food system. So thank you both so much for joining us today. I know the hours flown by and we've barely scratched the surface here. Um, so we are going to now pull up the Mentimeter questions, the responses, just very quickly. I'll skip over the first two. That's sort of just to get a picture of who's in the room. But the third one being really important, um, you know, what what is the most important food asset in your neighborhood or community? And I think this is a really important piece of information, not only for the validation process for our food asset map development, but it's also important to this, this conversation. And I would like you all um, to sort of think about why that might be the most important resource to you. Um, and is it something that everyone has access to or only some groups or neighborhoods? So these are the conversations we wanna to continue to have and hold people accountable um, in the action that comes. Um, so with that, I will pull up, I do see some good answers and, and the legacy gardens and community gardens are certainly important to this conversation. So I will pull up a, a final slide here. Um, I think John's gonna help me out there. Um, but, uh, and that would be just a reminder that evaluation surveys will be sent out for the event today and the series. And that's just going to help us as a, um, a council to know how can we improve events in the future if we are to do future engagement. So please respond to that. Um, we'll also send a link and, and a feedback form on the city website for the actual food asset map. So please provide us with any feedback if you have it. It is just a snapshot. I know you didn't get to see it today, but um, open to any feedback. Um, and th- there is a questionnaire, a food questionnaire available. And we would ask that you also complete that. And that's open until December 18th. And, and that will give us a sense of the information that we have in our community and, and ways forward. Um, and there are physical copies around Charlottetown for those who do not have internet access. Um, and there actually, I see on there, it says next sessions, but this is the last session of this series. So please stay tuned for future opportunities. Um, and to close out, I again, just want to remind everyone that um, this is not a solution. And instead, uh, we hope a first step. Um, we hope that uh, you'll continue to engage in conversations like these. Um, yes, Charlottetown, um, we're talking about Charlottetown here, but we are a unique island and really one food system and, and also needing to think about neighborhood and levels within communities too. So um, I would also like to acknowledge that there are limitations to people participating online. So hopefully we'll, we'll have more accessible opportunities in the future. But again, this is just the start. Feel free to contact us anytime. Um, you can find us on the, the Charlottetown City's website. Um, we have a food council page there. And thank you all so much for participating today. It was, it was wonderful to have you all here. Thanks to our panelists. Um, and so with that, merci. Thank you. Thanks everyone and stay connected. See you again soon.